Hey, this is Dr. Drew, and today I wanna to go through my favorite health hacks. Number one is get naked in the sun. Not literally, but expose a significant amount of your skin to direct sunlight, especially during the summer months when we have access to it. I think a lot of people are scared of the sun. They put on all kinds of toxic sunscreens, and we almost hide from it every chance we get. And I think over the last 40 or 50 years, this sort of narrative has started to sweep over people to the point where they have completely lost touch with all the wonderful health benefits that come with regular sun exposure. One of the big ones is natural antidepressant. When you go outside and get natural light on your eyes and body, it automatically increases people's mood across the board. One of the most important things the sun gives us is vitamin D. We can actually generate vitamin D in our body from cholesterol, which lines all the cell membranes of our body, just by sunlight hitting it. So the sunlight hits your skin, twists the cholesterol into vitamin D, and then it goes to the liver and kidneys to get activated into one of the most important vitamins and pro-hormones. Because without vitamin D, you're gonna have a little mood, You'll have a poor immune function, bone health, heart health, brain health, all of it will suffer. And since it's also a pro-hormone, it has a bit of communication with estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So you're missing out on several things if you hide from the sun. Not to mention slapping on the toxic sunscreen is a whole nother topic. The saying is this, if you wouldn't put it on your mouth or you wouldn't eat it, probably shouldn't be going on your skin in a large amount because the skin is like one big organ, or actually your largest, and it can absorb all kinds of stuff. And so if it's the wrong kind of things with toxic chemicals, and then you're avoiding the sun, you're really hitting yourself on two levels. You're lacking sun exposure and you're increasing your toxic load. And a lot of diseases come down to very few things, but the two big ones are too many toxins, not enough nutrients. If you don't get that under control, disease is just around the corner. So you need to think about that when you're putting stuff on your skin, or mouth for that matter, is this full of toxins, yes or no? Now I'm not advocating that anyone get burned. I'm not saying go lay out with full body exposure for five plus hours in the sun and get completely nuked. That is a bad idea. That is very hard on your skin and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sensible sun exposure, which looks for most people about 20 to 30 minutes of chest and back exposure whenever possible. If it's a nice day and the sun's out, go take advantage of it. Do it in the earlier hours and maybe the late afternoon hours because obviously midday sun is gonna be the hardest. You know, wear a hat, get some shade when possible, but generally speaking, sensible sun exposure is one of the best ways to improve your health. If you're looking for a natural sunscreen to prevent UVB damage and potentially reduce burns, look into astaxanthin. I came across this several years ago. I'm fortunate enough to go to Hawaii most years with my family. It's kind of like our Christmas tradition. And so when I first read about astaxanthin, I figured let's take it to Hawaii and try it out. And I was taking between four and 12 milligrams the mornings of that I knew I would go get some sun exposure at the beach. And I also have decent skin that's fairly sun resilient, but also building up a base tan is an important part of that, which I'll touch on in a second. But I feel astaxanthin has been very helpful for that. And it's actually derived from um, flamingos as well as fish. It's kind of what gives them that pink hue. So salmon and flamingos, they actually have a lot of astaxanthin. And so they can actually extract that into a capsule and then that helps prevent UVB damage at the skin level. And then with respect to base tans, I think where a lot of people go wrong with sun exposure is they're inside all day, they're in the corporate world, they're fully clothed, so even in the summer they're not getting much sun exposure. And then it's like, boom, spring break or summer vacation. Let's go to Mexico, let's go to Europe. And then they just get absolutely blasted with sun for a week or two, and they are pale as ever at the start of that trip. Well, of course their skin's not gonna know what hit it. Of course they're gonna burn. Of course they're gonna completely miss all the health benefits because you didn't build up a base tan. And building up a base tan is important. So a little bit of sensible sun exposure into the spring prepares you for summer. And then you can be out in it longer. The other thing too is I mentioned earlier that cholesterol, it lines the cells that the sunlight hits. And that's what turns into the precursors of vitamin D. Also what your cell membranes are made of, of are essential fatty acids. And if you have the wrong essential fatty acids of the cells of your body, it generates more inflammation. And the cell membranes of all the cells in your body is usually a blend of omega-6 and omega-3. If you have too much omega-6 relative to omega-3 in the cells of your body, when sunlight hits that, you can burn easier, which basically means a crappy diet high in omega-6 industrial cedar vegetable oils will put you at higher risk 
for burns. Now, the flip of that is if you have a good omega-3 to 6 ratio, you're limiting the vegetable oils and the industrial seed oils, you're probably going to be a lot more resilient when the sun hits you, okay? So don't fear the sun. Watch the toxic sunscreen. Build up a base tan. Figure out the diet. Good diet, good sun resilience. That is huge. Number two is minimize blue light exposure at nighttime. Blue light during the day and morning is one thing, and I always tell people a good night of sleep starts the moment you wake up, so you wanna go get bright light on your eyes, natural light, first thing in the morning. The lights inside, the fluorescence we're exposed to, not as good, but that tells your brain, okay, in about 12 to 14 hours, it's gonna be bedtime, so now we're fully awake, you get that cortisol rush, you get some light on your eyes, boom, sets that circadian rhythm for the day. But the opposite is at nighttime, you wanna make sure it's it's darker, it's dimmer, you're using things of a candlelight hue. So think of those oranges and reds. The blue light that gets thrown off from all the devices that we just completely inundate our minds with at bedtime is a bad idea because then your body's getting confused and it thinks, oh, well, okay, all this blue light's coming in, must be daytime. But you're trying to wind down in those later and early evening hours so that you can fall asleep. So it's really important to limit blue light at night. You can look into blue blocking glasses you can keep most of the lights off in the house that you don't need. You're trying to minimize screen time, like cell phones, tablets, computers, television, that kind of stuff. Because whenever blue light hits your eyes, it suppresses melatonin and it increases cortisol, which is a bad combo at nighttime. That's what you want in the morning. Don't necessarily want that at nighttime, okay? So really get a handle on the blue light. You can also install apps on your devices should you need to use them that just dims the screen naturally as the sun sets. It literally, you just set your time zone. As soon as the sun sets wherever you are, it takes the blue hues off the screen and it just generates the more you know, yellows, oranges, reds, that kind of thing. So super important. One of them is called Flux, F.L-U-X. You can install that on your devices. And then also for iPhone users, you can just put night shift mode on so it naturally does it for you. And then you're really trying to minimize screen time 90 minutes before bed so your brain, mind, and body can settle down. Number three hack, hydrate and drink good water. Tap water, distilled, purified, reverse osmosis, spring water. There's so many options out there and it's very confusing. I have done a bit of study around this because I'm a big water guy, I'm a huge water guy. In fact, most people walk around in a dehydrated fog and they don't get good water with the right minerals in it and this harms your health. There are people, believe it or not, known as water sommeliers, similar to wine sommeliers, where they have studied the ins and outs of water to great depths. And I've done a bit of research on some of these water sommeliers. And one of the lines that stuck out with me was, if the water is too pure, don't drink it. Which kind of like caused me to go, hmm, that's a weird thing to say. Like, I thought you want pure, clean, natural water. Why would you not want to drink that? And his whole thing was, if water's too pure, too filtered, too distilled, it has been stripped of everything that makes it live and helpful to your body. So water with minerals naturally occurring is a good thing to introduce to your system because if you strip all those minerals away and then you have water which is basically zeroed it's flat there's nothing in it but water when you drink that water it'll go through your system and it will pull trace minerals from all the different areas that it goes to but on the flip side if you were to drink spring water or add some electrolytes back in or use some trace minerals that i'm a big fan of and i'll talk about in a sec here that actually adds minerals to the water so that when you drink it it will absorb better It'll hydrate you better. And now that water won't leach minerals from throughout your body and organ system. So this is huge. And the way I kind of describe it simply to people is if the water's zeroed and it's been completely stripped of everything, your blood has an osmolarity of about 300, just for argument's sake, we'll say, just for a simple comparison. And the osmolarity is a fancy way of saying there's solutes in there, right? There's stuff, there's, there's blood cells, there's vitamins, there's minerals, there's carbs, fats, and proteins. There's all that stuff floating through there, which takes it from zero up to about 300. Now, if you just consume water that's gonna be completely stripped, your body's gonna to have to pull all those minerals from whether it's the bloodstream or the cells to dilute the water out. But if you drink water that naturally occurs with that kind of stuff, your body doesn't have to do it. So that's where natural spring waters like San Pellegrino can be really good because it has you know, magnesium and bicarb and calcium and sulfur all those wonderful things that raise the osmolarity of the water. And then your body can absorb it well. And, and the thing I always use for people as a comparative 
is if you drink a lot of water and you just feel like it goes right through you and you're like, I'm not absorbing this, what am I missing? What the heck is going on? Then you're probably missing that. Your kidneys and your body are just kind of like just kicking out water because you don't have enough solute in there. And I'm not saying go crazy with it, but some easy ways to do it are pinches of like, you know, pink sea salt, white sea salt. There's an electrolyte beverage I use called Spectrolyte, which is basically like they take water from the Great Salt Lake, which has tons of trace minerals in it. And you can add that into your water. You don't want to do too much or, you know, it can taste salty or a little bit different, but I love the stuff. It's a rapid rehydrator. It tastes better. I drink more water. I see four out of five people in my practice that are chronically dehydrated and it causes headaches and energy issues and brain fog and joint pains and poor digestion on and on and on. If they just get hydrated, it would literally erase like 80% of the symptoms that they come in with. It can be that powerful. There's nothing sexy about the topic, but it is a must for good health. And if you want to hack your health, get hydrated. One liter of water per 50 pounds body weight each day is a rough estimate for most people. Now, if you have ongoing health issues, run it by your doctor, say you have a kidney thing going on, you don't just want to do the liter per 50 pounds. So use some caution with that. But in young, healthy people, regardless of shape or size, I find the one liter per 50 pounds per day of water works really well. And number four is reduce EMF exposure. So EMF stands for electromagnetic frequencies. 30, 40 years ago, we didn't really have to worry about this and I wouldn't have even been talking to you about this, but with the advent of technology, Wi-Fi, cell phone towers, devices in the home, appliances, we are now inundated with significant EMF exposure. And since our bodies, and in particular our heart, are pretty electrical, it would make sense that high doses of this stuff can affect our physiology, and you bet it can, okay? So these are things like cell phones, microwaves, televisions, routers, smart meters, which they place outside the homes to sort of regulate like how much power is being utilized, cell phone towers, Wi-Fi towers, particularly 5G, which is a really strong frequency. This is starting to affect people's health. There are some people that are very sensitive to it and it almost drives them out of busy metropolitan areas because they simply just cannot live in those environments. Those are the rare cases and the extreme ones. And for the rest of us, it's just slowly picking away at us without you even noticing, because you don't really feel it in the moment, you don't really notice it in the moment, but make no mistake, using a ton of those devices and being really close to them, it's going to affect you. The first time I read about this was in 2010, there was a book by Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Body, and he went to check testosterone, sperm counts, and he was like early 30s. Came back like low or low normal, and he thought to himself, why would a guy you know, with muscle, pretty healthy, no major health concerns, be dealing with this. I actually traced it back to carrying his cell phone around in his pocket all the time. And that EMS that the cell phones are throwing off was suppressing the testicles. Took that out of his pocket and then anytime he went somewhere, if it was in his pocket, he would take it out immediately, put it in the drawer, get it away from you. You shouldn't be sleeping near it, it shouldn't be near your head, it certainly shouldn't be in your pocket up against your testicles. When he took that away and just as little as three or four weeks later retested, levels came up by triple which was hugely significant. We've also seen this cause heart arrhythmias as well, because what it does is it tinkers how those voltage-gated chal calcium channels in the heart function, and it just causes them to create imbalances, and that is a big one when it comes to heart conduction. And the whole cardiac potential, action potential, depends on proper levels of calcium flowing in and out. And so when you're messing with the voltage-gated calcium channels by carrying your phone under your bra or in the front pocket near your heart, that is something to look at. I do encourage some people, especially my super sensitive patients, to maybe hire someone or get an EMF testing device and just walk through your home and see where the hotspots are. See what it is. What do you need to unplug? What do you need to minimize exposure to? This is a real thing and the research is just coming out now. I believe there's a doctor, Martin Paul is one of the big ones that's been doing the research on this. So maybe you wanna look into his stuff with respect to EMFs. And they're starting to put these towers up around schools. So you have these developing kids that are around just huge doses of invisible stuff. So look into this one. I always just like to mention it to people. I know it's a bit of a newer topic in medicine. So it might kind of be like, eh, never haven't really heard too much about this. Not sure what to say, but I encourage you to do some research and maybe home proof uh, your EMF exposure. And there's lots of ways to do it and blunt it and get good devices that don't throw off as much. So that's all I'll say about EMFs, but they are a big one that's starting to kind of sweep the nation and the research is coming. So Number five hack is lift weights 
build muscle through resistance training, okay? This is a huge one. It's the ultimate anti-aging thing. If you just took one thing away from this video and you wanna live a long, healthy, happy life, it's lift weights, build muscle, stay lean. It changes everything. It fights every type of disease. It balances blood sugar, metabolism, blood pressure. Your mood and mental health will be about as good as it could be because if you could put exercise in a pill and sell it, it would be the number one anti-anxiety and antidepressant on the market. But since they can't do that, we have the wonderful SSRIs to do that instead. But lifting weights changed everything for me. Put me on a good path, kept me away from the wrong stuff. You know, a good body leads to a good mind, leads to a good life. I, you know, I can't tell you, you know, the privilege I have of, of seeing so many different uh, people in practice, so many different walks of life, and it just never ceases to amaze me that you get two people, same age, different choices, different bodies, different metabolism, you know, just completely different scenarios. The consistency I see with a lot of the patients doing really well is regular exercise, regular resistance training, and regular cardio, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit towards the end here through walking, which is uh, another one of my health hacks I'll get to in a second. But resistance training, huge. Builds muscle, builds strong bones. So for any of you females out there that are worried about bone mineral density, uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia, resistance training is the only way to fix that. Deadlifts, squats, lunges, presses, whether it's uh, chin-ups, pull-ups, pull-downs, whatever you need to do. It doesn't matter how old you are, old, young, you can start whenever. There's no pill that'll do it quite as good as exercise, so you must find a way to make that in. It can be bands, it can be body weight, it can be dumbbells and, and barbells, those are what I prefer, but whatever it needs to be, just get it in three, four sessions a week. It is critical. It will help stave off Alzheimer's as well because that's diabetes type three, they're starting to call it, which is just blood sugar handling issues. And these problems usually develop first in your legs. You'll get insulin resistance in your legs, which is your biggest muscle group, your thighs, your glutes, your quads, your hamstrings. So squeezing them, using them, building them, getting them stronger, they are the largest glucose disposal agent you have. And just simple exercise all the time, it just soaks it up from the bloodstream and then your body doesn't have to work so hard to clear it. So this is huge. It gives you metabolic flexibility, which most people don't have, okay? And then for joint pains, it's wonderful because the only way to really surge blood into the deep corners of the joints, you know, reduce arthritis, get the ligaments and tendons healed, is through exercise. Sedentary, sitting around all the time is not gonna have good blood flow to those areas, and that's gonna cause chronic pain. So the way out of that cycle is to strengthen those areas. I can't stress this. Enough. Your confidence will go through the roof. You'll have better self-esteem. You'll feel better about yourself. Your digestion will improve. Your sleep will improve because when you tucker out your nervous system from intense weight training, you fall asleep like that. So bring exercise and muscle building into your life. It will change everything. Number six is learn how to breathe through your nose. If you are a mouth breather, by default, this causes problems. It will change the neck and jaw dynamics so your entire face structure will change. And then when you sleep, you won't get deep restful sleep. And this can drive things like sleep disorder breathing, sleep apnea, and even if you're getting seven or eight hours, it might not be high quality sleep. And the reason for this is we were designed to breathe through our nose, but a lot of people have sinus issues, whether it's structural issues with the septums, they have bad allergies to food and alcohol and they're always congested, so you can't breathe through your nose, you'll default to your mouth. And they've never thought that that is not a normal thing. They've kind of just been going along with it. For a large chunk of my 20s, I just thought, I guess when I go to bed, one nostril is always plugged and whatever side I laid on, that was the one. And then I started to realize, well, alcohol and beer really plug up my nose. Food sensitivities really cause phlegm and mucus in the airways. And then you default to mouth breathing and now you don't get deep, restful, restorative sleep. And the main reason for that is because you have certain receptors in your nose that cause vasodilation system-wide. So the blood vessels relax, the heart relaxes and there's less stress on the nervous system when you breathe through your nose. That's why the phenomenon of mouth taping has become so popular over the last of a while because if you put a little strip of tape on your mouth, it forces you to go through your nose. But if the nose is blocked or not open or you have bad allergies or there's like, you know, bacterial imbalances, fungal issues, whatever it may be, throwing off more phlegm and mucus and you can't breathe, well, of course you're gonna default to your mouth. So this is huge. And for anyone out there that has chronic fatigue, maybe their sleep is good, maybe it isn't. Always a good idea to just rule out sleep apnea. If sleep apnea is an issue, it doesn't matter how long you sleep, quality will not be there. This can usually drive hypertension, cardiovascular stress, and does need to be treated if that is the case. Main causes of sleep apnea though, just as a little side note, it's usually food sensitivities, airway obstruction, or just too much tissue. So, you know, overweight, 
um, too thick neck, and then boom, you know, you got issue with the jaw, the tongue, more tissue, can't breathe properly through the nose, boom, you'll be snoring or doing it through the mouth. So maybe a CPAP machine is needed, can be a lifesaver for people. They'll have a whole second win and just be like, wow, I have more energy than I ever thought. So just some side notes there, but uh, breathing mechanics are huge. And slowly in through the nose and out through the mouth, box breathing, slowing things down, really important stuff. I don't pretend to be a breath expert. There's books on books on this and none of it's taught ever to us and we just kind of default to whatever our default is. And so I'm really wanting people to start to get in tune with that. Like, can I breathe through my nose properly? Is there a blocked nostril? Am I allergic to stuff? Am I drinking things or alcohol that may be jamming me up? Like you need to start asking the hard questions so that you can breathe easily and peacefully through your nose. It is huge for health. Number seven would be balance your hormones and metabolism. So for the guys, I'm talking about testosterone balancing and thyroid balancing. And for the ladies, estrogen, progesterone, and thyroid. Those are key systems. You will not feel 100%. You will not act and show up 100% if there's a problem with any of those. As we age, the metabolism can slow down and the hormones can drop, but that's also a sign of aging too. So if you're looking to anti-age, you kind of turn the ship around. What can we do to improve our testosterone? What can we do to not lose it to estrogen if you're a guy? And for the females, how do we you know, get rid of whether it's estrogen dominance, imbalances between estrogen and progesterone, or just uh, deal with the perimenopause, menopause transition easier and with less side effects? Those are all important things. And as the body starts to power down and reduce those things, you'll feel it. I always tell people the best years are still yet to come. And you know, if you're not getting continually better with your health and with your wellness and with your fitness, then something's up and, and there's some room to improve there. So that's why I'm like, I'm big on testing, I'm big on getting baselines and I'm big on fixing what we find and never dismissing something as low normal or low as just, ah, you're getting older, that's the way it is. It's like, what can we do to optimize that? So this is stuff you should be hitting head on with your doctor. Testosterone levels, estrogen levels, um, you know, free and total, sex hormone binding globulin and thyroid levels for guys. And then for females, I'm a big fan of doing urine hormone testing to get the whole picture. What's the estrogen, one, two, and three? What's the progesterone? What's the estrogen detox look like? Like are the metabolites building up? Can we get it out of the system? What's the, uh, the male hormones like for the females? Cause you need a little bit of testosterone as well. And what's the cortisol system doing? Cause that actually has a little bit of a backdoor pathway. It's really a triangle of thyroid, cortisol, and sex hormones. And that access needs to be minded. It, it, you know, if you have too much cortisol for too long, eventually you can burn out and feel flat, or those high cortisol levels can suppress your thyroid function, which will also suppress your sex hormone function because if your body thinks that you're running from a saber-toothed tiger, it's gonna deprioritize metabolism, which is the thyroid, and your sex hormones, because it's like just trying to keep you alive, so those aren't that important. So let's just put those on the back burner. So you gotta mind those three systems have tons of crosstalk. That's why the testing I do goes very deep into that. I don't just check a single hormone and say it's high or low. It's like, what is the symphony of these three systems look like and sound like? And then we fix it from there, okay? So I'm a big fan of urine testing um, for the ladies. Guys usually, you know, just basic blood stuff like I was saying earlier, gives you the full picture of all those things. However, urine testing for them is also really good because it gives you a few more pieces. And then from there, it's like, do we need to do, is it herbs, is it nutrients that are causing the problem? Is it stress that's causing the problem? Do we need to add some thyroid support, which I usually start with desiccated over Synthroid because desiccated has a bit of T4 and T3. And remember, T3 is a spark plug that gives life and plugs into all the cells. And if you have high cortisol, you're gonna have low conversion. So Synthroid as T4 is not gonna to convert to T3. So I like the desiccated there because it has a bit of both. Maybe we need to take it a little further, say the herbs, nutrients, botanicals, thyroid, cortisol supports not getting the hormones going. Maybe that's when the girls have a discussion about bioidenticals. And I'm not talking about synthetics, which a lot of the research has been done on. I'm talking about bioidentical hormones. So your body treats them like the same molecule to replace potentially progesterone and estrogen as needed. And then for the guys, depending on age and what we've tried and how far they are in their journey. TRT therapy is something to look at as well. Uh, getting a good medical doctor on board to make sure they can take you through that. And then you just kind of fix what you find and you go from there. But it's never just one thing. It's like I said, it's the crosstalk of all those systems. It's so important. If only it were that easy to just shoot one hormone in and fix it all, but it's not. That's why the, you know, the layers and the complexity, you need some help with this so somebody can walk on that journey.
with you. Number eight would be get your beauty sleep. Now I've done full videos on sleep, why it's broken, how to fix it, things to look into because it is that important. And you can just see it on people's faces when they don't sleep six, seven hours at least most nights, you'll see it all over their face and it wrecks all kinds of stuff with respect to your health. After a bad night of sleep, you're more insulin resistant. So you're not really in fat burning mode, you're more in fat storage mode. You'll be less likely to work out, your focus at work and production will suffer. And that's when you do tissue repair and memory consolidation at night. So if you're not getting good sleep, you're just missing out on so many different things. Drives up stress on the system, can cause you know higher instances of cancer and, um, and heart disease down the road. And so this is a pretty important one. Wake up at the same time, natural light on your eyes first thing in the morning, exercise first thing in the day to tuck yourself out. Make sure to minimize blue light at night. Look into things like GABA, L-theanine, passion flower, Epsom salt baths at night. Uh, make sure to have a good bedtime routine. Minimize caffeine and alcohol because those tend to wreck sleep. Uh, you don't want to have too many heavy meals before you eat. So you're trying to be done food about three hours before bed. And then no electronics about 90 minutes before bed. Try not to hit snooze in the morning. So when you get up at that same time every day, you're just reaffirming to your body and mind that like this is the rhythm and cycle we need to be on. You know, if you hit snooze and sleep an extra 30 or 45 minutes, it just kind of throws things off again. And your body doesn't know what weighs up and that stresses it. And then that's why, you know, the fatigue and then the poor sleep habits continue because your body doesn't know what weighs up because you're always like, you know, going to bed an hour early or hour later or, you know, sleeping in or whatever on the weekends. And so you're trying to keep consistency seven days a week, okay? And then number nine is walk far and walk often. They do these things called the 10 minute walks and I got it from Stan Efferding. Mark Bell does a lot of them as well. It's very simple, do a 10 minute walk after each meal and just simply walk more. Is the number one way to stay lean. It's an excellent form of cardio, and it's just as good as blood sugar medications for lowering blood sugar after a meal. How crazy is that? No pill required, just go for a walk, a brisk walk. Doesn't have to be like out of breath or anything. Brisk walk, five minutes out, five minutes back. Helps activate those leg muscles I was talking about earlier to soak up blood sugar from the bloodstream. Wonderful option. Also really good for blood pressure balancing, and it's just a way to move more. It's not the same though, if you do 30 minutes at the end of the day, because a lot of people will be like, well, I'm not gonna do 10 minutes times three. I'd rather just do one big one at the end of the day. It's not the same. You're trying to break up all the sitting we do, all the immobility and the um, sedentary life that we keep, I'm trying to break that up and walk as much as possible. If you want a number to shoot, th shoot for, 20,000 steps a day would be great. I know everyone's hung up on this 10, but you have to remember like our hunter gatherers, our forefathers before us, they used to walk at least 18 to 20,000 steps a day. Like 10 was just getting going. And so if you're looking to stay lean, if you're looking to do cardio without chewing into your hard earned muscle, if you've got blood sugar issues, blood pressure problems, or food sits heavy after meals, just get out and walk more. Walk, walk, walk. It is one of the best things you can do for your health. A true health hack, easy to do, fun to do. And so 10 minute walks for the win. That wraps up my top nine health hacks. If you have any questions or comments, please drop them below. And if someone in your world would benefit from this video, please share it with them. And as always, thank you for watching.